Grace and peace to you all. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hello there. This is Pastor Pimpong, and this is my wife, my lovely wife, who doesn't want her face in the camera. Amen. But we are walking. We are walking this morning. 30, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and it, today is the 19th day of the 12th month of the year 2019, which is slowly coming to an end. And at this point, so many of us are so frantic. You know, so many are very frantic. Others are very anxious, you know, because you don't know what the new year holds. But you see, the word of God says that you and I ought not to think about what to do tomorrow. Let tomorrow think of itself. All we have to do today is to make sure that we are holding firm to Christ and being faithful to him. Beloved, can you imagine, today is the 353 days of the year 2019. God has faithfully carried us. God has faithfully carried us, giving us sunlight, you know, in the midst of 30 degrees following high temperature. We have sunlight, courtesy God, freely. He has given us sunlight, he's given us cold air, he's given us fresh air, he's given us rain, he's given us, name it, everything that pertains to life. God has faithfully supplied us. And what do you and I have to do? To do? What do we have to do is to love our God and to be gracious, grateful to him and to praise him all day long. Beloved, I have a word today. There's a word that God has placed in my heart to share with all of us. You can find that in the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2. Titus is a book that comes after 2 Timothy. I mean, so you can turn with me. Look at this, the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, it's very, very quick and powerful. Very living, live. What is it, quick? It's alive. Amen. But look, in the book of Titus, Paul writes to Titus and exhorting him and, and, and telling him what to do. And in chapter 2, he tells him to exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. Now, when we make mention of servants, the very thing that first thing that comes to our mind is when somebody brought from the village somewhere to go and serve another person who is well to do well that's a servant also or um, maybe slaves who were brought here and stripped of all, the, uh, of all their dignity and made to serve you know that's what perhaps what somebody thinks of but you see a servant actually do you know that the political leaders are servants they are the president is a servant senators are servants you know Congressmen are servants. Judges, are, they are all servants. They've all been put in their place to serve us, to serve the society. So every one of us is a servant. We are servants. And so a politician occupying, being a congress or whatever, have to think about his constituencies, those who elected him and put him there, because they are the ones who have appointed him to represent them. So he's a servant to them. And so what Titus, Paul is telling Titus, to, to tell servants, he's saying to all men, every one of us, we are servants. We are servants. And he says, servants have to be, you know, submissive, obedient to their own masters. Which means that those of us, people who elected representatives, are masters. We tell them what, what they need to do for us. But do they do that? No, they don't consult with us even before making decisions. They don't. So I don't want anybody to take that word servant, you know, to be like a derogatory word, you know, that which is demeaning. No, 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 no. A servant is one who does service to somebody else, another person, be the person a rich man or a poor person. The person who serves him, we are to serve at the pleasure of God, who is our master. God is the master of all. And we, even we serve God. We serve others, you know, as a pleasure. God is the one who has placed us there to be servant. And he says, to serve our own masters. 
So then, if I'm in District 6 and there is a congressman, he is serving those of us in District 6. We are his, we are his boss. And they are to serve and to please us to do what we ask them to do. In the same way in their home, the person is a servant serves. And on and on, even in the churches, a pastor is a servant. He serves the flock. A pastor is a servant. We are servants. And he says, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Not answering again, which means that you don't argue. You are working for, for somebody. You are working for a company, your executive. He says, don't answer back. Don't, don't argue. You know, in this world of rights, 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 it's very hard to really tell somebody, don't answer back. You know, but the word of God says, don't answer back. Why? Is it for God saying that you should become a carpet for somebody to walk over? You know, that's not what he's saying. But he wants to let you and I know that he is our defense. And if we submit to him, that is God, and we do as God says we should do, he will fight for us. And yes, he will. He will. God will. And you can tell about Daniel. Daniel was, was lied upon. He didn't answer back. They threw him into the lion's den. And what happened? The lions didn't eat him. The people who lied on him, they were thrown in the lion's den. He won the heart of his, 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 the king, Dairos. The same with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were lied upon, thrown into the fire. What did they do? Did the fire burn them? No. So we have to learn to be very submissive. That's what the word of God says. They're not purloining. Now, when you use the word purloin, the word purloin means stealing. You know, there are so many who are stealing. When we talk about stealing, we begin to think about maybe a servant, somebody who was of ne we have declared to be a non-entity. You know, when we look at thieves, but thieves, there are thieves in high places and they are stealing billions of dollars. These are people in high places of authority and they know how to steal and cover it up for nobody to know. I always become obvious when you are somebody of no power, it becomes obvious and you begin to self-sentence Whereas somebody who is at the top, who is stealing billions and millions of dollars and putting them in an offshore bank, goes God free. You know, he's supposed to be a servant of yours, but he's not serving. And I have to make this thing clear because that is, then you can appreciate the word when God says that, let the servants be obedient. But it is not like that. There are so many who are not being obedient. But I pray that as we enter into the new year, Every one of us will get to know that we are servants. We are servants. You know, pastors taking money, buying private jet planes and flying. You know, in the meantime, the congregation, people are struggling, can't pay their rent, can't pay their bill, they can't pay their children's school fees. In the, why is the pastor or bishop or whatever it is, has his own private jet or perhaps riding in a million dollar car and wearing a thousand, thousand dollar suit? You no know, $5,000 suit. For what? As if he will not die. And yet, he fails to realize the fact that he is a servant to serve the flock of God. He says, not purloining, not stealing, but showing all good fidelity. When you say fidelity, faithfulness, and, you know, cause or belief, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Servants, to adorn the doctrine of God, of godliness, in all things. Why? Because the grace of God, therefore the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that deny ungodliness, wow, and worldly lust, we should live soberly. When we talk about soberly, soberly, that is in moderation, we should live in moderation. When you are flying in a private jet, which costs about $65 million, that is not moderation. Especially when there are people in your congregation who can pay their rent, who can pay their light bill, who can't even afford breakfast. And yet they are putting the money at your altar under the guise of sowing seed, whilst you are flying high. That's not moderation. Instead of living in moderation, we should live in moderation. Moderation. 
fidelity, living soberly is living in moderation, self-restraint, which means that you can afford this, but because of so soberliness, you say no, you restrain yourself, you keep yourself from doing that. That's what they say we should have to do. Titus, my beloved, and the Holy Spirit of God helps us to do all that. Temper temperately, being temperate in a serious, sensible, and solemn manner. That's how so being sober is. You know, being sober, living a, so a sensible and a solemn lifestyle. Righteously, it says, living righteously and godly in this present evil world, my beloved. That's the word of God. I want you to go in and, and, and read it and see what Th Paul had to say to Titus and to all of us because his Titus is to proclaim that to the souls that he has been appointed pastor over to teach it and he says why is doing that we should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ wow are you looking forward to the second coming of Christ, are you? Are we? In this day and time when the focus has been shifted on to material things, money, 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 wealth, 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 wealth. We are not, we are trying to like push back the coming of Christ because we've loved the world so much. We love the world so much that we want to enjoy the world. When the Lord Jesus Christ says that he will come after me, let him take up the cross, let him deny himself and come follow me. The word of God says that he who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. My beloved, it says looking for, are you looking for? Wow, looking for that our great God, Jesus Christ, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. The blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming soon, my beloved. He is coming. So the time to put our, our the, there is no need for you and I to become distracted. But I brought last, yesterday's message that I brought in the book of Timothy. said that the one who has enlisted in himself in the army of God, if you are in, uh, pursuing him, you don't allow yourself to be distracted by anything. It says he who is in a warfare does not concern himself with the things of this world. We are in a warfare, beloved. Wow. Now he says, and what did Jesus Christ do? He gave himself. He said, who gave himself for us that he might, listen to what he said, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, not some iniquities. He gave himself that he may redeem us from all iniquity, all iniquity, all sin. Okay? When some of us say, well, God is not yet through with me. He's, he's still working on me. He's still working on me and all those that kind of thing. You know, you know, God, he, Jesus Christ gave himself that he might redeem us from all, all iniquity. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. Hallelujah. We are at a junction and waiting to cross over. That he may redeem us from all iniquity. My beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself up to redeem us from all iniquity. All, what is iniquity? Iniquity is the, you know, the willful desire to live in sin. Willfully, willfully indulging in that which is evil. You know, our world is saturated with that. You know, he's saturated with iniquity. The grace, when we, whenever you talk to people, they say, well, it's grace, oh, it's grace. Oh. Yes, it's grace, but grace teaches us to abstain. Grace teaches us to turn away from all iniquity. Grace teaches us to turn away from all iniquity. So if you and I are latched onto sin and we are doing it, then we are actually trampling underfoot the grace of God, treating it as though it is just nothing. You know, Jesus gave himself for us that he might, he said, he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us 
unto himself. That is the reason why Christ came to die, to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify us unto himself. Because he is pure. Because he is pure. Because he is pure. He purifies us so that we will be like unto him. Purify us. You know, that we will be like unto him. You know, unto himself. A peculiar people. A people who are peculiar. peculiar you know what you talk about peculiar? Peculiar is somebody you look at. You know, in a strange manner. How is it that, you know, you don't, I mean, go where we are going? How is it that there are so many beautiful women around? My friend, no, don't, you can't just be with just one woman alone. You can just go and be with other people, you know. But the people who have been purified unto God know only their wives. And they are faithful to their wives. And so when you don't do those things that the people of this world do, you become peculiar. The Lord has redeemed us. He's a purified unto himself. You know, a peculiar people who are zealous of what? Good works. We are zealous unto good works. We are to be zealous unto good works, unto good works, unto righteousness, unto holiness. Hallelujah. He said, tells T Timothy, he tells Titus, the Titus, these things I want you to preach. I want you to speak and exhort and rebuke. Wow. I want you to speak, exhort and rebuke with all authority. So you see. When you have some preachers saying, well, we are already in a sin, we have already been reading, we say, so I, I'm not going to talk about sin. I'm not going to preach about sin. And they are not doing what God's word says. He says, Paul is telling Titus, Titus, he says, with, he says, speak this, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Why? Let no man despise you, my beloved. This is God's word. He said the same thing to Timothy. In Timothy, when you go to the book of Timothy, it, Paul tells Timothy to do the same thing, to preach, to rebuke with all authority. My beloved, this is God's word for us today. As we prepare to enter into the new year, my prayer is that you and I, go back and read the scriptures again. I've, I've always, when I deliver the message, I tell you, go back and read it. It is important. Go back and read it so that it will not be like Pastor Pimpon is misleading you. I don't want to. The Lord that delivered me, the blood, Jesus Christ, with which I have been redeemed, is so precious. It's so precious that I'm not willing to uh, circumvent it or uh, to water it down. No, you know, it, it says teach, preach with all authority. With all authority. Jesus Christ is coming soon. And the grace of God that we, the grace, you know, it caused the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That is the grace of God. Amen. And as I spoke last yesterday, that we should be strong in the grace. Second Timothy chapter 2. Be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are talking about. To say no to sin. To say no to sin. To say no to sin. To say yes to righteousness. And to, be, to stand. Because soon Jesus Christ is coming. Listen, I love you. But there is one who loves you the most. His name is Jesus Christ. On this, this day, today, the 19th day of December, temperature 30 degrees. Pastor Pimpo, in this cold weather, is exhorting you and I to ensure that our anchor is firm in Christ Jesus. That we swim in Christ, live in Christ, enjoy him. Live in the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. Okay? Listen, God bless you. Grace and peace to you. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Bye-bye.